Verse 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you. That when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me and none of you ask me where you're going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So you will recall that last time we spoke about being hated by the world. And that the Holy Spirit would come to help us. And we've been speaking about what Jesus said would happen to the disciples in the world. Although they were going to experience wonderful love between themselves, between each other. They were commanded by him to love one another. They would not have any love from the world, quite the contrary. The world would hate those that believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus said that. He spoke about them hating him. And if they hated him, they would hate his disciples hate us also. He said there was a time coming when people who killed believers would actually think they were doing God's service. Actually working for God by killing Christians, by killing believers. Even Paul the Apostle, before his conversion, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, well, he thought that he was really being zealous for God trying to stamp out this cult that he thought was a cult, stamp out any belief in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. However, he was wonderfully converted and went from persecutor to preacher. That's a marvelous thing, isn't it? From one extreme to the other. And then we spoke about the Holy Spirit helping us, enabling us to live for Jesus Christ. And that without the power of the Holy Spirit, that we cannot live for Jesus. That we need the anointing of God. We need the power of God's Holy Spirit to be able to stand as witnesses. He said that the Holy Spirit would testify of him and that we would bear witness of Jesus. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus Christ today in that he is in you and he's in me. And he anoints you to Uh, to be his witnesses, to testify of Jesus Christ in the world. And there is no way, of course, that we could live for Christ in a Christ-hating world, a world that is so opposed to righteousness. There's no way that we could be his witnesses without the power of his Holy Spirit. He told the disciples that they were to wait in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high, that they might have the power and the anointing of God in their lives. That yes, every single one of them, when they were born again, they receive it. All believers today, of course, being born again, you do receive the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. But Jesus talked about this other experience that we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they were to wait in Jerusalem till they be endued with power from on high and be baptized with his Holy Spirit so they might be his witnesses, a wonderful anointing of God to serve him coming from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus goes on to tell them that he was going away. And that sorrow, of course, had filled their hearts. It wasn't the first time that he said this, but he did say it there in verse 6 again. He said, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But then he adds, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. 
It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So I'm sure this would be very, very difficult for them to comprehend. To even imagine how it could possibly be an advantage to them for Jesus to go away. It just seems to be, well, it just seems to be an impossible thing to even consider. He's always with them. He was always there, right with them. And they totally depended upon him. Wherever they went, he healed the sick. He opened the eyes of the blind. He raised the dead. And they depended upon him for their provision. And wherever they went, he provided for them. Even when they had no food. Remember, he did these great miracles like changing a few fish and little loaves of bread into food that would feed not just them, but the multitude that was there. Yeah, they depended upon him. And for him to be saying that his going away could never have been in their minds seen as an advantage. I mean, if you'd have been in their shoes, just try to, it's difficult for us, but try to imagine what it would be like. You would have never thought, it's a crazy thought, to consider that for him going away was an advantage to them. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, wouldn't make much sense to you when you heard that. I mean, to be there walking around with Jesus. Thinking that now, yes, he's our leader. He's, he's going to lead us into this glorious kingdom. He's our head and we're following him. And how wonderful it's going to be. Now I'm going away, he says. How could that be an advantage? Well, you see, he knew that what was going to happen in the world was going to be a much greater achievement than he could personally achieve just by walking around with a handful of men that he picked out and they were limited. He was limited to a certain location. They had no idea of this. They had no comprehension of what we all now know. That his name and his word and his gospel was going to spread throughout the whole world. And that multitudes upon multitudes of people would believe in Jesus Christ. And for this to happen, Jesus knew that they needed the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to see this happen. And they needed the person of the Holy Spirit in their lives to help them just as Jesus had helped the disciples, that every believer was to have the Holy Spirit living in them to help them as they went through their lives. And that he could be with them, the Holy Spirit, wherever they were, all of them. But now we come to another work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus speaks of here, the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit. He says, when he has come. And let's not forget that the, this Holy Spirit is a person, that he also is God, not a force, not a sort, sort of cosmic energy like, may the force be with you. Not an it, but a person. He, when he has come. And he is God. Of course, this is a great mystery. How can God be three persons and yet one? Beyond my comprehension. Yet that is what the Bible teaches. And so therefore we come to verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So when he has come, this person, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. 
And so there is a person in the world today that prevents the world from falling into utter chaos and anarchy. It is the person of the Holy Spirit. And we shall see once again that there is a means that the Holy Spirit uses to convict men and women of sin. And there is, of course, the vessels that he uses. We have the Holy Spirit. The convicting work of the Holy Spirit is the means that he uses. And the vessels, of course, is you, is the church of Jesus Christ. You and me, the body of Christ. And so the work of the Holy Spirit in the world today is convicting the world. And it basically centers around these three things. The conviction of sin, the conviction of righteousness, the conviction of judgment. And each of these convictions have a cause. The conviction of sin because they do not believe in Jesus Christ. The conviction of righteousness because Christ ascended to the Father. And the conviction of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. You know, this week as I looked at this, I realized there is no way we could cover all three at one time. You all breathe a sigh of relief. Because you will be getting hungry in a little while for your lunch. No, we will not be here all day. Because there's no way I can cover all three at one time. And so I propose to cover the first one at this time. And the remaining two next time. So again, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Of sin because they do not believe in me. The conviction of sin. The God has graciously condescended to work in the human race. And although people might not understand or see it as a work of God's mercy and God's grace, it is. It's the love of God who has sent the Holy Spirit to convict of sin. That's a gracious work of God. It, it, well, in fact, folks, of course, for the most part, are probably uncomfortable with this work of this kind of work of the Holy Spirit, convicting of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Nevertheless, it is a gracious work of God. It is a gracious work of a loving God to convict men and women of sin. You see, he could just leave the world as it is. Just leave it the way it is. You know, kind of say, I'm done. I've had enough. I'm done. <clears throat> you look at the sin in the world today, the wicked things that men and women do, the child abuse, the molesting of children, the horrible murders and rapes and violence. Crime data from 2022 it says from Baltimore, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York City, Philadelphia, Seattle, and Washington, D.C. found that violent crimes have increased uh, up to 40% compared to the same time frame in 2021. That violent crimes, of course, are typically defined as reports of rape, sexual assault, robbery, assault, and murder. All these things have increased. And more and more of what not too long ago would have been labeled as being perverted, is now being normalized. Well, I remember Noah and what God said to Noah. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. <clears throat> and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. He said the earth is filled with violence. It may be worse now. And so we wonder, why does God put up with it? He doesn't have to. He could leave men and women to themselves. And eventually what would happen in the world if God was just to suddenly withdraw his Holy Spirit and the convicting work of the Holy Spirit and take all Christians out of the world, well, 
the world would destroy itself and will. It would rot. He calls us the salt of the earth. That is a preservative. And the Holy Spirit in you is what keeps back the flow of ungodliness that will, when you're taken out, when you're taken to glory, the Holy Spirit in you, being you're taken to glory, and the earth will build the people that will basically destroy themselves. That will be the judgment of God, of course. But without that preservative, it would rot. And so were it not for the gracious work of the Holy Spirit, men and women would be totally given over to their own desires and their own lusts and sin. I mean, you think it's bad now. But if the Holy Spirit wasn't in the world today, of course, you wouldn't want to be here, and thank God you won't be here. He will take you out before that great tribulation period. But today, men and women have their own ideas about righteousness and standards of righteousness and what they believe God requires of them, or he doesn't require of them. And of course, it's going to end in terrible judgment, which was really reserved for the prince of this world for Satan. That's what hell was built for. For Satan. But thank God, this is still the age of grace. We are still in the day of grace. And God is still at work. This is still the time when God is long-suffering toward man. He is patient. And manifesting his grace. There is still enough grace for everyone. And even this manifestation of his grace. As a manifestation of his grace. The Holy Spirit is still at work. Convicting men and women of sin. And there may be someone here today. Or someone watching online. And God has been so wonderfully gracious to you. And you yet, you have not yet turned your life over to Jesus Christ. And God has still not judged you. God has not poured out his wrath upon you, but rather he's gracious toward you. And if that does apply to someone here today or someone watching online, may I give you a word of warning. Do not mistake God's long-suffering, God's gracious and patience. Do not mistake that for any kind of weakness or inability to judge. Or what is more likely the way people think is to think that to God it's really no big deal. He's just a loving God and he's kind of going to overlook all of, you know, my sin. It's really no big deal to him because he has, I mean, if it was, then surely he would have, Struck me down and judge me. You see, the fact that God is merciful and gracious towards those who sin today does not mean to say that he agrees with it or that it meets with his approval. It's just that he's gracious and long-suffering. And it's a big mistake that some people make, seem to think that because God hasn't sent a thunderbolt from heaven upon them, that he really doesn't care too much about the way they live. Or he sort of winks at it, as the scripture says. But God doesn't wink at sin anymore. It says in Acts 17.30, At the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. That he commands all men and women everywhere to repent. And just because he doesn't rain down fire and brimstone upon a sinful world does not mean to say that he approves of it. Not at all. And if anyone here or watching online is convicting, feeling a conviction work of the Holy Spirit in your heart today, even as we speak, well, that's God. That's a gracious work of God because he loves you. But you need to respond to that love. I'm going to give you that opportunity at the end of the service to respond. 
God is convicting you because he loves you. He's not given up on you. He loves you. You say, well, it really doesn't feel like love. Doesn't feel very comfortable at all. Here you are, you're talking about sin again. I'm sort of burning inside every time you mention sin. I, I call her up and I have this churning in my stomach. And you just keep talking about sin and I keep coming back here. I don't know why I keep coming back, but I keep coming and you keep talking about it. Well, the Holy Spirit is working in your life. We had a dinner with the, <clears throat> some of you probably there with the, meet the pastor's dinner and Lo, I always love to hear Logan. I love to hear all of the guys tell their story, but Logan got saved here and it's kind of special when he tells his story. This is exactly what he, what he was doing. Just kept coming back, getting convicted, going out and sinning, coming back, getting convicted, going out and sinning. Just kept doing it until one day, couldn't handle it anymore. Had to get saved. <laughs> it's a great story. And whether you realize it or not, it is a demonstration of his love for you. The more uneasy you feel, the more you're experiencing the love of God. It's gracious. Now we have the cause here in verse 8. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of sin because they do not believe in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there have been all kinds of the grossest of sin manifest in the world throughout history, through the human race. Terrible sins, wicked sins. People do things that you and I can't even imagine. We don't want to imagine. You don't want to have those thoughts going through your mind. But there's so much evil in the world today that <clears throat> we can't even comprehend gross kind of sin and yet God sees it all but you know the worst of it is the sin of unbelief the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ the unbelief or the lack of belief in Jesus Christ is the worst sin of all the climax of the sins of the world is the rejection of Jesus Christ I mean he says they will be judged or convicted of sin because they do not believe in me. The man will be judged for sin. Yes, I do believe that. I do believe there will be a judgment. And we'll talk about that more about that next time. But there will be a judgment for man's sin. For his rebellion. For his disobedience against the holy God. But there need not be. For God has provided forgiveness. God has provided pardon. He's provided Cleansing all in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as a man or a woman rejects Jesus Christ, they commit the worst of sin of all. Maybe a moral person, maybe a respectable person, a churchgoer, an upright person, but he is guilty of the worst sin of all. <clears throat> and he's convicted and reproved of sin because he's not believed in Jesus Christ. Now, some may disagree with that. They may say, well, I'm not a bad person. How can you say I'm guilty of the grossest sin of all? Because I don't believe in Jesus? What does that mean? How can, I, how can that be? Just by not believing in Jesus? Just because I don't believe in Jesus Christ? You mean I'm guilty of the terrible sin? Well, none has put it any better than Alexander McLaren. Let me read it to you. He says this. Some of us do not think that it's sin at all. And he's talking about not believing in or rejecting Jesus. Some do not think that it's sin at all and tell us that a man is no more responsible for his belief than he is for the color of his hair and such like talk. Well, let me put it very, let me put you a very plain question. What is it that man turns away from when he turns away from Jesus Christ. 
the plainest, the loveliest, the loftiest, perfect revelation of God in his beauty and completeness that has ever dawned or ever will dawn upon creation. He rejects that. Anything more? Yes, he turns away from the miracle of self-sacrificing love which endured agony and shame and death for the sake of those who inflicted them upon him. Anything more? Yes, he turns away from hands laden with and offering him the most precious and needful blessing that a poor soul on earth can desire or expect. End of quote. And so when you reject Jesus Christ, of course, you're rejecting the Lord God, but you're rejecting everything that God wants to do for you. And you are rejecting everything that he has already done for you. And so the Bible teaches us that men prefer darkness to light, that they turn away from God's wonderful manifestation of love in Jesus Christ. And what a sin it is to stand in the perfect revelation of God and see nothing in it to desire. What a terrible sin it is when God offers forgiveness and cleansing and purity of life and eternal life of peace and joy and yet just to stand there and reject it. And of course, God would be quite right and quite just within his rights to put every single one of us to death because of us then. Well, he hasn't done that. Instead, Jesus has died upon a cross for us. And yet there are men and women of this world that know this message, that have heard this message and care nothing for it. What do I need to be pardoned for? Sin doesn't bother me. Why should I desire to be cleansing? I'm not dirty. That's what some people think. Nothing wrong with me. I've never hurt anybody. And then there are others say, well, I don't care. I like dirt. What is the cross of Christ to me? And the man who has no response in his heart for the sacrificial love of God, the love that God has shown him at Calvary, commits the greatest of crimes. The most evil of all crimes, the one who cares nothing for the wonders that Christ holds out for him to possess is surely guilty of the greatest of sins. And not believing in Jesus, of course, it is really a subtle sin. It's a terrible sin, but the immensity of the sin and how awful it is, is not immediately evident. It's not obvious like the filth and the disgusting things that we see in the world today, the horrendous crimes of society. They're obvious, they're blatant. And they're right there before us. Every night on the news, something like that. Some terrible crime, a terrible thing is shown to us. And they're blatant right there before us. And yet they all have their cause, their root in the same common cause. That is a perverted love of self. And it's a perverted love of self that rejects Jesus Christ. And that's really the definition of sin. You want to define sin? It's living for self, living with self at the center. You want to design faith, uh, define faith? It's making Jesus Christ the center of my life. And living for him. And all of sin culminates in the rejection of Jesus Christ. And it is sin for which men and women will be convicted. Unrepentant men and women will be judged and sent to hell for rejecting Jesus Christ. Now, God will not have to go down a list of sins. He may do. He probably will. Because people are judged for their sin. He doesn't have to though. I don't know what he's going to do. Maybe he has some sophisticated way of doing it. And showing people it all. I can't imagine. I mean we. Just in just a short time. We have seen amazing developments in technology. We have computers that are able to and do stream our Sunday services out on the internet all around the world. They go out no matter where you are. And you can see them on your phone. 
on your phone. You can see the whole thing taking place wherever you are in the world, as long as you get a signal. You can see these things. What a marvelous thing. Amazing thing. Like you see stuff on your phone like that. I can stream my football team from England and watch them lose. I see people losing all the time these days. It's a miserable experience. But I can watch them on my phone if I want, let alone my television. Amazing, isn't it? But I wonder what kind of technology does God have? Like someone asks him, why are you sending me to hell? And God just goes, watch. And maybe it doesn't come on a big screen. Maybe it's just in your brain. Maybe something's just projected in your mind and you see everything super clear about what's gone on and sin against the holy God. I don't know. I don't think he even has to do that. But maybe he shows people all the times that they had the opportunity to commit their life to Jesus Christ. And all the time they blasphemed his name. One time Carol and I had lunch together. <clears throat> We're walking out of this restaurant and out of the mouth of this woman came all these blasphemies. Using the name of Jesus and blaspheming. I want to repeat them. And Carol said, and she does, she says, I, I just hate that. It's worse than foul language. Out of the mouth it comes. And it was an older person. And there's nothing worse than an older person, a woman at that, using such profanity and blasphemies. And then there's every word that's spoken in jest, every word spoken against the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and perhaps every thought that someone's had against the Lord. He certainly has the capacity to show, it, show you it all. Whether he will do that, I don't know. Because it surely suffices enough for him just to say, what did you do with Jesus Christ? Did you accept Jesus Christ? Did you give your life to Jesus Christ? Or did you reject him? And that's enough to send anyone to hell. That's enough of a sin to condemn everyone to hell. Because it's the worst sin of all. And it's the one that will be judged. All of the sins is where we'll be judged of all of the sins because we've not believed in Jesus. And here's the situation. Nobody needs to die in their sins and go to hell and be judged for their sin because Jesus Christ offers forgiveness. This is all, imagine this. Someone is dying of a terrible disease and here's the cure, here's the antidote. Maybe you've been poisoned or something. Or whatever, you've got some sickness and here's the cure. It's definitely a cure. It's a medicine. All you have to do is take a pill or drink this medicine or whatever or an injection and you're well. You're made healed, you're made well. Well, you'd be foolish to reject it, wouldn't you? Absolutely foolish to turn it down. Now, when you've died... People look at you and someone says, well, what, what, what did he die of? You say, well, he died of such and such a disease. But someone would be quite right in saying, no, he died of stupidity. <laughs> because he didn't take the medicine. He died of stupidity. He didn't inject the serum or whatever that would have cured him. And a lot of people are going to hell because of their stubbornness. And their rejection of Jesus Christ. Can you die of stubbornness? Yes. Bible calls it hard-heartedness, rejecting Jesus Christ. And you, you reject Jesus and you go on rejecting Jesus Christ and there's no hope. And they go to church, some visit church, go with their families. I would say that they'll be here at Easter or on the beach to our sunrise service. Or they come at Christmas time. They come, they hear the gospel. Once again, they reject Jesus Christ and they don't think of it being such a terrible thing. But listen, it is a dreadful thing. It is what will send men and women to hell. 
He's going to send his Holy Spirit and convict of sin. He says, because they do not believe in me. They'll be convicted of sin and they'll convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me, he said. But if that's, that doesn't have to be you. I know that many of you are believers today. I don't know if all of you have your names written in heaven right now. I don't know if all of you are saved. I don't know that. God knows. Perhaps in this room or watching online, there may be someone who has yet to come to Christ. Maybe you came with friends or with family. And maybe it's your first time. Perhaps this is the first time you've been challenged in this way. If that is so, this is just the right time for you to be here. It is the best time for you to respond, for it will never be any easier. You say, it's not easy. No, it's not easy. Yes, a battle rages on inside, and we, many of us can tell you about it, what we went through. When we were on the wrong side of glory, as it were, of salvation, when that challenge came, there is that time inside when there's that struggle. But listen, Satan does not want to let go of you and he will intensify his efforts to drag you to hell now that you've been presented with these truths. It won't get any easier. The truth that yes, you have sinned. We all have. We all have. Christ has borne that sin on Calvary's cross. And all that's left for you to do is to respond to his call. Do not add to your sin by rejecting Jesus Christ. Come, accept him as your Lord and Savior today. Be washed clean. Be made new. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things become new. You turn to Jesus today. Do not turn away from him. He loves you. And once again, he has shown his love to you by sending his Holy Spirit to convict you of sin and draw you to Christ that you might be washed, forgiven, begin a whole new life with the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. So will you come today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are faced with these truths. It, it's your word, Lord. It's, these are your words, Lord Jesus, words that you spoke. And so, Lord, we, we come to you again today and thank you that you did send your whole and have sent your Holy Spirit that has worked in our lives, brought us to an understanding and knowledge of the truth about ourselves and about you. We thank you for that, Lord. And now we do pray that if there's any here at all, Lord, or watching online, that have not yet turned their life over to you, I pray that you would touch their heart, Lord, today. That, Lord, you would just find the work of the enemy that would keep them from you, seek to keep them from you, Lord. And draw them to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.